this talk is more on the application side of the of AI, and in a sense, it's also more of a hopeful application, but we'll see as we go along. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about psychopathology models, that is models of mental illnesses, and how AI might assist to address certain challenges that so far we cannot really meet with contemporary models. So first of all, when we want to model mental illnesses, then the question we must first answer is, what are mental illnesses to begin with? If we want to investigate mental illnesses, then we need to investigate scientifically abnormal mental states. And in order to research what exactly these are, we need to delineate them on the one hand from life problems, such as grief or immoral behavior, on the other from neurological disorders, such as brain tumors or Parkinson's. And there's the spectrum, really. A lot of the prototypical mental illnesses lie somewhere in between life problems and, mental, and uh, neurological disorders, such as depression, personality disorders, and schizophrenia. But they also exhibit features that you would find in life problems or neurological disorders. So it's, it's really kind of hard to, to pin down where exactly to draw the boundaries here. But for current purposes, we can say they are somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. All right, then. So what are mental disorders? Well, usually the standard view in medicine is that mental disorders are disorders um, that, that are basically constellations of specific syndromes, syndromic symptom constellations. And these symptoms are supposed to have a common cause. So there's some kind of underlying common cause. Usually the suggested view is that it's some kind of glitch in the brain circuitry. And if this is the case, then the, the mental illnesses we're looking at, the psychopathology we're studying, that's conceived of as a brain disorder. So mental disorders are really just brain disorders. This is one standard view that has been very common over the past few decades. Now, the problem is that on the one hand, this is very plausible and research speaks in favor to it. On the other, we have the spectrum and we know that a whole bunch of factors are relevant to different aspects within this spectrum. So for instance, we know that, um, that sociological or environmental or genetic factors also play into mental disorders and how they unfold. So more recently, people have been suggesting that understanding psychopathology really requires looking at a variety of different factors, promising and thus promising models of mental disorders should be multifactorial in nature. That is, they should include multiple different kinds of factors and incorporate them in a single model. Okay, everybody, uh, anytime somebody wants to admit the room, my mouse isn't working, so bear with me if it, if it takes some time for me to click the slide. Um, anyway, so notably, real-world data on these different various factors can take various different forms. So for instance, you could have imaging data, which is static from CT or structural MRI scans, but you could also have time series data such as EG, ERP, fMRI, or PET scans. Then in addition to that, you could have genomics or other molecular data. You could have clinical data based on cohort data or individual data, could be based on symptoms, questionnaires, interviews, or even insurance claims. So you can see that this is quite a different data set if you base it on insurance claims than it would be if you base it on imaging techniques, for instance. Then you could have epidemiological data or behavioral data, for instance, collected from mobile phones, such as mobility or usage of social media or communication patterns or any of this. Now, the challenge for a multifactorial model is not only to acquire these different kinds of data, but also to link them somehow, to bring them together, to integrate these in a complex computational model, maybe using something like deep neural networks. And if we want to do that, then the major worry is these potential algorithms that might incorporate all these kinds of data tend to be somewhat opaque and not interpretable to researchers, patients, or clinicians. And thus, maybe they're not useful for treating, understanding, or preventing mental illnesses at all. And this is 
what's really one of the major challenges for multifactorial models. Now, so far, I've been talking about multifactorial models and haven't shown you any. Now, what is a multifactorial model? What might it look like? Maybe you feed all of these different kinds of data into a complicated algorithm, but then what's, what's the result? Here is what one multifactorial model might look like. This is leaning on a suggestion proposed by Boris Blum, Kramer, and Carlis in 2019 in their BBS paper. Basically, what you have here is a network. It's a network with different nodes representing different relevant factors and edges representing connections between these factors. Mostly, this is usually based on correlational data, but the interpretation that's given to these graphs is kind of a causal interpretation for the most part. And at least that's what Boisman, Kram, and Carlos also suggest in their BBS paper. And what you can see here is you have different nodes in the center. Where's my mouse? Okay, it's gone, so you can see it. Um, I'll just verbally point it. So you'll have the center um, that's dark with the four S nodes. These would be symptom nodes. And you have in the external field, that's the lighter gray, you have E nodes, G nodes, and N nodes representing environmental, genetic, and neurological factors or variables that are relevant to a certain disease. Now, these obviously look somewhat promising. I'll go into a more detailed assessment soon, but this is just to give you the gist of what might be a multifactorial model, what might it look like. Now, what's the project for today? As I promised in the title of this talk, basically, um, I want to talk about the challenges that such multifactorial models face. And I've already pointed to one, namely integrating the data, and another, namely making it clinically applicable, but there are more. So first of all, I'm going to examine what the challenges are, and then I'm going to look at three different contenders that are currently on offer in, in the literature with respect to psychopathology. And finally, I want to discuss ways forward and in what to what extent AI might be helpful in this respect. And that's where we come to the application. All right, so let's start with the challenges that multifactorial models face. First of all, multifactorial models must be able to incorporate multiple factors or data types. This is what, what I already outlined in the very beginning. So we must incorporate multifactorial, uh, multifactorial data to grant that these models actually have a multifactorial nature. This is what I call the challenge M or multifactorial nature. The second challenge directly derives from this first challenge. It's the issue that's also known as variable selection. So what factors should we even consider potentially relevant and how can we distinguish them from background conditions? That is, was, what aspects of a patient's development and or their surroundings should be included in a mental disorder model? And should we consider some sort of phenomenological variables as well, maybe? And how do we know what good variables for such a multifactorial model as the one I showed you are to begin with? These are all questions connected to the, to the question of which variables to select. And this is one of the, the major challenges, especially when you want to include multifactorial data. Now, there's a third challenge, and that's related to the second challenge. It's the issue of picking the right levels or scales of analysis for a system. So how should we analyze a complex system such as a human being? And are we aiming to look at different ontological levels in any meaningful sense? Or at which scales are we looking at, say, organic or neurophysiological factors that we're including? And how could these levels potentially relate? So this is not only a question about like what specific variables we might be able to select given our methodology, but also a question relating to theoretical relations between different of our multiple factors we're looking at. Now, again, related to these three challenges, we have the challenge of complexity or devising a model that has tractable complexity. How complex can a model be while it still stays tractable, but still delivers meaningful insights? So how can I accommodate for, first of all, having this multifactorial nature, but also meeting the, the requirement of clinical applicability, which is actually one of the later challenges I'm also going to list. 
likely the answer to this complexity challenge will go hand in hand with answers to se variable selection and levels. Now suppose for a second that all of these challenges can be addressed. Yeah, we, we have good answers to variable selection levels and thereby complexity. And we did meet multifactorial nature through some clever variable selection maybe. Then what remains is the challenge of integration. And this is really something that, that, that's very important when you think about multifactorial models. How do we relate the different parts of the model and what are the relations between the variables and the different data points? A straightforward interpretation is, as in the model that I showed you a few slides ago, that the relations are causal between the different variables. But that's definitely not the only option you have. And also it's one that's not really philosophically backed by the, the data we analyze. So definitely a good question to ask is how do I get everything together in one model? How do I integrate its different bits? It's kind of like piecing together a puzzle and the question is how do I stick them together? Now, even if we can address this, this issue, a further question re remains, namely the question to what extent do mental disorder models provide insights into the temporal dynamics of psychopathology? It is well known that psychopathology develops over time. So it's well known that mental disorders unfold. They have different phases. They have an inherent dynamics and they change over time. And since they do that, the question is, how can we capture this adequately? Any one given model of a mental disorder will probably, if you just capture a specific point in time, will probably be insufficient. You have to look at how the disease unfolds and maybe even across patients. Which brings me to the next point, namely the question of generality versus specificity. We must wonder to what extent mental disorder models can accommodate for general features of mental illnesses that apply across patient groups on the one hand and patient-specific factors on the other. Besides, and now we come to the final challenge, the one that I already pointed to, um, we, we want our insights from the model to be clinically actionable. That is, um, we want our model to actually help select diagnostic and treatment options that, and in that way, the clinical actionability challenge is related to variable selection levels and tractability uh, and tractable complexity. And we want to make sure that what, whether we have a model that's, that's based on within or between subject data, it will be clinically actionable either on the general or on the specific side of things. Besides, um, we want clinicians to be able to use the model. So they must be somewhat interpretable to clinicians, if we want to use that term. Now, if you look at this list, it's actually quite a mouthful. It's, it's, it's quite a lot that, that's on there. And the project for me in this talk is to look at different models that are currently offered for mental illnesses in the literature and see like to what extent they can actually meet these challenges. So now let's see how the contenders fare. First of all, so I'm, I, I said I'm going to look into three contenders. First of all, I'm going to look into network models, then brain con connectivity models, and then so-called multiplexes, kind of the newest game in town. Network models are based on two ideas. First, we have a bunch of correlational data. And then secondly, we can apply machine learning or statistical modeling to, to yeah, calculate some kind of graph, maybe causal graph, some kind of network in order to, to give us an idea of the relations between variables. And the multifactorial model I showed you in the very beginning is actually one of such network models. So here again, at the core, you have the symptom network with just symptoms interacting with one another. And then in the surrounding field, you have the other factors. In the external field, you have the other factors that actually also interact with the symptoms. If you just look at it at first sight, it's a somewhat really plausible model um, or plausible way to model mental illnesses because we can have the different variables representing the different kinds of factors. And it's natural with respect to what kinds of things may be represented. 
But while this at first sight is a clear advantage for multifactorial modeling, it also leaves the issues of selection levels and complexity essentially unanswered. Besides, there's a general complication here as well, namely that while a cause reading is frequently proposed for these multifactorial network models are usually based on correlational data. And whether that will be sufficient to infer causal relations, or whether causal model is actually what we need in order to grasp psychical pathology, that remains at least questionable. And even if it was, it's still a static model. That is, the, the challenge of addressing temporal dynamics has failed. Now, besides, this model as such does not tell us how we actually integrate the different kinds of data. That's kind of a mystery done in the or done by the algorithms. All right, so let's let's look at this systematically. Here's a little table, our scoreboard for today. So I said that multifactorial network models easily address multifactoriality, so that's fine. I already said they leave considerable room with respect to variable selection and levels and thus complexity. So you could include anything if you wanted. Um, then as for integration, that's also tricky. Like there is this, this temptation to give these networks a causal reading, but we don't really know if that means the factors do causally interact or whether that's the best possible interpretation. We also have this idea that somehow maybe symptoms or behavior variables are grounded or implemented by neurological factors or by stuff happening in the brain. And somehow these different kinds of relations, causation versus implementation or, or uh, grounding or realization or whatever is your favorite, that should somehow be represented. And there's no room for that in multifactorial network models, at least not according to the view defended by Bospum, Kama, and Carlos. I also said we don't really have temporal data included, though what we do have is we have a certain kind of representation of temporal dynamics here as we can look at different states within the network over time. So if you look at the network in one time slot and then in another and then at a third point in time, you will probably see that the connections that are recruited will change over time. So to a limited extent, you might say, yeah, some temporal dynamics is there, but the model as such is primarily static. Now, when it comes to generality versus specificity, there are two things you might want to say. On the one hand, you could say the overall structure of the symptom network is general, while the specific pattern of connections, including the strength of specific connections, that is different between individuals. And that way, you could at least, to a certain extent, address the generality versus specificity challenge. Another answer you might want to offer in response to this challenge is um, we can create these models based on between subject versus within subject data. If it's between subject data, they are more like general models. If it's within subject data, then it's more like um, very patient specific models. And depending on what your data you feed in, that determines whether you get a general or more specific model out. And notice that these two strategies to deal with the challenge of generality versus specificity actually work for any of the models I'll be talking about today. So we could basically fill in the scoreboard already blank with all the, all the um, ticks here. Now, finally, how about clinical actionability? I already said that um, if we look at just symptoms, like the core thing in the middle that you had in the, in the graph on the previous slide, then that's rather straightforward because symptoms is something that clinicians actually deal with. So some, if you just focus on symptoms, then we might have pretty good clinical actionability. On the other hand, if we include all kinds of factors and you don't know what precisely their relations are, then it's really hard for a clinician to draw actionable insights from these kind of models, especially given that clinicians usually cannot actually manipulate genetics or they, and they can't do that much about the environment, for instance. So I would say, again, this is, limited, so we have a little bit of actionability, especially when we look at variables that are, that are clinical variables, such as symptoms, but other than that, maybe it's not so good. All right, so 
overall, yeah, multifactorial network models are multifactorial, but other than that, it doesn't look too good. So if this is the case, then let's move on to the next contender. So I said the next on the list are brain connectivity models. Now, no minister omen, these brain connectivity models focus on brain networks rather than symptoms or all different kinds of factors in the environment. There are three different kinds of connectivity. You could look at structural connectivity, which is basically anatomical links, functional connectivity, which is basically um, connectivity based on concurrent activation, and affected, effective connectivity, which is connectivity estimated based on the causal architecture, based on how functional connectivity changes over time. These three kinds of connectivity are usually studied in or depicted in separate models, though we might try and bring them together into a single model, in which case we might already think of this resulting model as a kind of multiplex. I'll talk about multiplexes in the next section. So, I mean, just take that as a footnote for now if you don't yet know what multiplexes are. So either way, and unsurprisingly, these models are not really multifactorial in nature because they are indicate uh, they, they are focused on the brain. So they look at brain connectivity, even though it's different kinds of connectivity, it's all very brain focused. And we might wonder how do they fare then with respect to the other challenges? Now returning to our little scoreboard again, brain connectivity models fail the multifactoriality challenge. On the bright side, they meet selection levels and complexity and have straightforward answers to each of these that are usually based on the very imaging technique that's being used. So what the variables are is usually determined by your very imaging technology. For instance, DTI and fMRI straightforwardly constrain the variables that could be measured. And how to pe best specify the relations between nodes in the brain, uh, between the nodes in these different connectivity models is a little more tricky. But usually, this is also based on purely correlational data. And then based on this correlational data, often causal relations are estimated, at least when it comes to effective connectivity. This is backed to a certain extent by good dynamical causal modeling algorithms, but it also doesn't, yeah, it also doesn't withstand all philosophical worries about inferring causal relations here. So I'd say integration is only addressed to a limited extent. Besides, structural and functional connectivity models are static and the causal interpretation is at least limited. It's limited in the sense that you, you, don't, you don't actually have the, 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 the right kind of data to, to infer causal relations here. Effective connectivity models are often based on, as I said, dynamic cost modeling techniques, and these do time series data, do take time series data into account. So in that sense, we might say temporal dynamics is addressed. And to a certain extent, we might also say, and I'll explain this when we get to multiplexes, that this brings us to, to a specific kind of multiplex. As for the generality challenge, we can also reiterate the by now familiar reply. So on the one hand, you could say it's a general it's a general structure with specific parameters, or it depends on whether you have within or between subject data. So yeah, we can kind of meet that challenge. And when it comes to clinical action actionability, I would say this is very limited, even more than with the multifactorial network models, because um, even if theoretically you know about differences in connectivity between patients, it's very hard to actually clinically address this. So I'd say this is rather failed than not. Okay, so connectivity models are kind of cool because we have these specific answers to levels, variables, and complexity, as well as partially to integration but they are not multifactorial in the way we want. Even if we combine all three kinds of, of connectivity, we leave out other kinds of factors, such as symptoms, behavior, genes, um, environment, and so on and so forth. Now, finally, let's turn to multiplexes. 
what the heck are multiplexes? I already mentioned them a few times, but here we go. So multiplexes are kind of the newest game in town when it comes to psychopathology models. And very briefly put, you would say they are essentially networks of networks. Over the past decade or so, they have become increasingly used to analyze a whole range of complex real-world systems in biology and sociology, as well as in technological studies. With their network-like structure, multiplexes at first sight at least seem very intuitive to grasp, and it seems very easy, and it seems like it's a tool that you could work with in the clinic when you, when you study a patient. But since all the kinds of factors that can be represented as nodes in this network, um, they may, these networks might also become super complex and very hard to actually interpret once you have them. So while it is true that you may gain a better grasp on the multifactorial nature of mental illnesses, and this framework promises to provide an integrated framework for building comprehensive models of how mental illnesses develop um, and how they might be diagnosed, treated, and so on and so forth, it is hard to make sense of the patterns that, that may be there. For that, we sometimes, or some, some authors say we might refer to AI, and now we come finally to the application part for AI. We need to recruit AI systems or machine learning algorithms to uncover patterns within these huge network models that we cannot see as humans. But their biggest strength is also their biggest weakness. Namely, you can incorporate all kinds of data and uncover and, and all kinds of pattern, but that also means they can basically model any kind of relation between any kind of variable, and we don't really know what any of the the links between the variables mean. So one way to create a multiplex that's, that's rather straightforward and that's maybe still somewhat intuitive to understand in the end is that you can draw out um, multiple instances or iterations of the same network over time. So this is the kind of thing I've hinted at with the symptom, uh, with, with the multifactorial network already when saying, well, we could look at it at different points in time. In that case, you have what I call a temporal multiplex. So here, the different layers of the multiplex are basically your different, same multifactorial networks. And then this could look like this, where you have your multifactorial model, you have different points in time um, that you look at, at which you look at the model. And in this way, you could transform static models into dynamic ones, meeting the temporal dynamics challenge. And that's actually an option that would also be open to brain connectivity models. And some of the brain connectivity models actually do it that way. An alternative way of representing this kind of, in this case, multifactorial temporal multiplex would be to have a single layer of network with recurrent connections with differential equations within each layer. But that's not as intuitive to grasp as this kind of representation. Okay, so how do these temporal multiplex, not multiplexes, excuse me, fare with respect to the challenges that I outlined? They could in principle be multifactorial, but do not have to be. They could also be just say symptoms or just brain data based. And um, in principle, there are very few constraints on the variable set here, leaving lots and lots of, of freedom and thus leaving unaddressed questions of variable selection, levels of scales and complexity. As for integration, we know at least how integration along the temporal dimension works. We do have temporal dynamics taken into account for generality versus specific specificity. We use our by now familiar answer, and we have a limited clinical actionability in the sense that it depends on what factors are being considered and when a patient is diagnosed. So at least when it comes to this temporal aspect, and at least when the variables are like targetable for the clinician or meaningful for the clinician, we do have clinical actionability. Okay, so that looks better. But at the same time, it's clearly not a multifactorial model, or at least not necessarily so it's not really satisfying just yet. 
Now, what else could we do? There's a second kind of multiplex you can build, and this is the proper multifactorial multiplex. Here you have at each layer of the network alike variables. For instance, you could have genetic variables at the bottom layer. You could have um, neurologic, neural variables in the middle and behavioral symptom variables at the top. And it doesn't have to be structured that, they, that way. It's just a simple example for, for, for you to kind of get the gist. Now, if you have these different layers that are identified by, by, by scale or by size or by kind of variable or by function, then you can have interlevel links between the variables as well as cross-layer links that are links that are usually identified between different kinds of data sets, usually by the assistance of, um, uh, but, yeah, usually assisted by certain machine learning algorithms. Conceptually, that looks very promising, but there's a caveat. There's not actually a concrete case where this has been done so far. There's no like specific mental disorder to this has been to which this has been applied at this point, at least not to my knowledge. So at the moment, these multifactorial multiplexes are rather abstract theoretical approach. Yet this is precisely where the potential of machine learning kicks in, namely. Um, by linking these different kinds of layers and linking, thereby linking different kinds of data set. So let's suppose this is a hopeful suggestion and we can actually build these multiplexes by using clever machine learning techniques. And the question is, how do these models then fare with respect to our challenges? Well, let's get back to our scoreboard again. They are truly multifactorial, so that's clear. Um, however, we cannot address variables, levels, or complexity because, again, these multiplexes are extremely unconstrained, so these are not addressed. The generality and specificity challenge can be, of course, answered as usual. Temporal dynamics, in this case, is not included. This could be a purely static model still because we're just looking at um, any given yeah, it, it relations between different kinds of variables at any given layer, and there's no like requirement to include time in the picture here. As for integration, we don't really have a clue how to integrate these different layers. We leave it to an algorithm, and the question whether the relations correspond to anything that's actually existent, say a metaphysical relation or an anatomical relation or some kind of conceptual or theoretical relation, that, that's hard to tell, and it's, it's absolutely unclear at this point. Finally, when it comes to clinical actionability, this is also tricky because the relations between the layers within the multiplex may be rather, um, may be rather easy to interpret, or we may give, them, give the relations within any layer causal interpretation maybe. But then what the statistical relations between different layers between variables from different layers are going to be, that's, that's tricky. And we don't really know how to make sense of them in a meaningful way. And besides, many variables may not actually be targetable for the clinician, even if they're included in the model. So I'd say, well, it's somewhat like with brain connectivity models here. Okay, so now overall, what's the scoreboard? What does it look like? Not too enthusiastic, to be honest, because you don't actually have a model that meets all of the challenges. Now, the question is, how can we achieve this possibly? How can we make headway? How can we go forward? And my suggestion here is that in order to make headway, let's actually acknowledge that the two kinds of multiplexes I discussed each offer a solution to one of those challenges that are particularly pressing in psychopathology models and then take it from there. Okay, so what's my suggestion? First of all, we must notice that while multifactorial multiplexes address the multifactoriality challenge, temporal multiplexes address the temporal dynamics challenge. And my suggestion is to combine these two strategies together and build what I call 4D multiplexes. 4D multiplexes look like this. You have basically the multifactorial multiplex listed over time at different iterations. So you can say it's a 
it's a it's a temporal version of a 3D multiplex, if you like. Now, you might say, okay, cool. Now, these 4D multiplexes may address temporal dynamics and multifactorial nature, but if anything, that preserves interpretability issues and increases complexity and tractability worries. Yes, if we just do this, yeah, but I think there are ways out. So just looking briefly at the scoreboard, the questions we can already answer is multifactoriality is met, temporal dynamics is met, and generality and specificity is met in the usual way. But from there, as I said, things seem to somewhat go downhill. On the one hand, we don't have clear constraints on variable selection, levels of scales, and complexity. Um, on the other, we don't have a clear lead on how to integrate these different data kinds, as we didn't have it from um, the multifactorial multiplexes to begin with. And clinical actionability is at, at best limited, also given the potentially enormous complexity we might have. And complexity here has an exclamation mark, not only across, but also an exclamation mark, because it's probably going to be worse if you have a 4D model than if you have any kind of 3D model. Luckily, however, I think we can supplement 4D multiplexes with practical constraints, heuristic assumptions, and mathematical tools and tools from artificial intelligence to try and remedy the situation. Now, what are these tools? The crucial question we need to answer to address selection levels and complexity really are the same as when we're building 3D multiplexes. What variables are supposed to be included at different layers? How do we identify and individuate these? And do, what do we know about systematic relations between variables within and across layers? While, there will be, while it will be unlikely that there's a universal answer to any of these questions, possible answers will be significantly constrained in practice by available data. Um, and not just available data, but also methods or tools that scientists are using, as well as their specific focus questions, um, their research questions, their operation, operationalizations, their data processing pipelines, and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at this, then it seems, okay, based on the methodologies, design, tools, and um, yeah, available, available measurements, you, you get quite some constraints on your variable selection. In addition to that, you can make heuristic assumptions such as that neurophysiology is the basis for behavior, and you can focus in on specific questions and depending on the specific skills that a researcher has and the specific tools they are using, you'll again constrain your variable selection and also the potential relations between variables. Now, if we grant this, then we can say that variable selection and levels of scales are at least addressed to a certain extent. And if this is done, that also partially addresses at least the integration challenge because you can base insights about relations between variables of different kinds where you can interpret them based on your theory, your theoretical assumptions. While the practical constraints I outlined are unavoidable, they are not, um, they are not usually universal or objective. Even with standardized brain imaging techniques, there's no objective data um, since data acquisition is always by, guided by idiosyncrasies, as, for instance, Zina Ward has been pointing out. And let us get worse if we think of, for instance, data about questionnaires relying on patient self-assessment. That is, a scientist's specific research question and what questions they are interested in is extremely important in order to interpret our data. And in psychiatry, as in many other life sciences, we find that specialists from different disciplines contribute research from a plurality of epistemic perspectives or explanatory styles. And we have to integrate all of these different perspectives, somewhat like the blind men touching different parts of the elephant, have to get or get, only get the whole picture by taking it all together. This may yield many partial models when we think about psychopathology. And the promise of 4D multiplexes is to bring it all together into a single model. 
The tricky question is, though, how can these various insights and these various partial models possibly be constrained and integrated such that they can be brought together without having outrageous complexity and that complexity is getting totally out of hands. Recall that this is precisely the challenge for multifactorial data that I pointed to in the beginning. Complex computational models like deep neural networks, for instance, have been raising high hopes that we might link all of these different kinds of data and all of these different partial models when it comes to psychopathology models. But then the resulting models are often highly complex and somewhat opaque and not interpretable to researchers. Now, what really remains for us to answer is then how can we address integration and complexity? How can we meet these challenges? What can we do? As for integration, I think we can actually have the hope that algorithms supplemented with certain heuristic assumptions derived from theory might do the trick. Though it is unclear how exactly that is or how that can be done. But what's clear is that one source to draw on is complex system science in this case, a discipline um, that is used to handling dynamic multi multivariable interactions at different spatial and temporal scales and where we already have clever algorithms that, that, that can handle such situations. So tools from machine learning and complexity science may actually help us address the integration challenge. If so, then, What's remaining is C, the complexity challenge. This too can be addressed, I suggest, at least partly with methods from machine learning or so-called XAI or interpretability methods might be helpful to reduce complexity and identify what factors are most relevant or um, yeah, most helpful to predict, prevent and treat mental illnesses. If we do that, then, if we can rely on XAI or interpretability methods here, then we can actually tick this box as well. Now, if all of this can be achieved, then the score for 4D multiplexes doesn't actually look too bad. We, we actually have at least to a certain extent all of the above challenges addressed. Note though that any answer to any of the challenges you might give will automatically constrain what other answers are open for, for any of the other challenges because they are linked. And also note that what I pointed out as strategies for 4D multiplexes to meet integration and complexity, these are also challenges that, that, or these are also strategies that could be applied to other models that fail these challenges. But I still think that 4D multiplexes are the most promising model of psychopathology or the most promising kind of model of psychopathology because they combine these strategies with the model type that addresses both multifactoriality and temporal dynamics, which none of the previously discussed models achieves. In summary then, I suggest that 4D multiplexes present a chance to make significant headway in psychopathology modeling, and that they can only achieve that when they are supplemented. They supplemented with constraints on the one hand from practical from the practical side and based on our methods that we're using, but also on the other hand, constrained by theoretical assumptions and um, other heuristic assumptions. They must incorporate or they can incorporate multiple perspectives and data types. And this can be achieved by drawing on tools from machine learning and complexity science. Finally, to reduce complexity and gain interpretability, we may draw on XAI methods. Note that what's super important here to, to realize is that to achieve all of this, machine learning experts and domain experts need to closely work together from the design st stage onwards to find appropriate constraints and thus design useful models of mental illnesses. And obviously, um, clinicians will be some of the domain experts to be involved here. Now, before I close, let me just use the opportunity for some, some shameless self-advertisement. If you're interested 
in Explainable AI and its influence on society. Join us in our lecture series from the project Explainable Intelligent Systems. It's run in hybrid, so you can easily join from wherever you are. If, you're, if you want to know details, just check out our website. Well, and that's it from me. Thanks very much for listening. And I hope that this was useful, even though, well, more of a tentative application of AI. Thank you.